Now we're going to put everything that we have learned together to look at a, an optimization problem that looks like the one that you're seeing, which combines all of the elements that we have seen and is a very important canonical maximization problem in economics. This involves maximizing over two variables, x and, y, and y, both of which cannot be negative and are subject to an equality constraint of the following form, px plus qy is equal to w, where p comma q comma w are greater than zero. Now, why is this such an important problem in economics? Because it basically looks like a more general version of a consumer problem, in which you can think of u and v as the benefit functions for x and the benefit functions for y, and you can think of this as a budget constraint. How can you think of that as a budget constraint? Well, if P is the price of the good x, this is how much you're spending the good x. If Q is the price of the good y, this is how much you're spending the good y, and W is the total wealth of the consumer. So this is the problem of a consumer that has to maximize total benefits given that it cannot spend more than W units in wealth. And in fact, as long as the marginal benefit of X and Y are positive, the consumer is going to want to spend it all, hence the quality constraint. Now, in all of the problems that we're going to study in the course that has this form, we're going to impose our version of concavity assumptions that for this case look like this, the marginal benefit for goods for both, sorry, this is V, just to be clear, for both goods is greater than zero, and the second derivative for both goods is less than zero. In other words, the additional benefit that each unit of good X or Y generates in the margin goes down as X and Y increase. Now, we're going to see that these concavity assumptions are going to be able to generate the existence of unique solutions just in the same spirit and using an intuition similar to the one that we have seen before. Let me conclude this introduction to this part with a comment about how this material relates to that that you will encounter in more advanced courses in economics. It is possible, and you learn that in, for example, first year graduate school in economics, to, to solve this problem for any number of goods, not only for two goods. Now, that requires the use of more general optimization principles like Lagrange multipliers and Contoker. One of the neat things about thinking about the problem in this simple way with two goods is that we can get most of the economic intuition and most of the economic insight from those more general models using a two good model in which we don't have to use those more advanced techniques. Now, at first sight, this problem looks much more complicated than the previous one, since it involves two variables and this new equality constraint. But with a little bit of thinking and cleverness, we can transform this problem basically into the previous ones that we have been solving. And the next two remarks are going to teach you how to do that. So the first remark states that you have to use the quality constraint to simplify the, simplify the problem. And this is how. So the budget constraint says that px plus qy has to be equal to the wealth w in the interpretation of the consumer. Now, this implies that at any solution, y has to be equal to w minus px divided by q. Now, why is that useful? Because if you know x, you know y and vice versa. So even though in principle, this looks like a two variable maximization problem, given the quality constraint is just a one variable maximization problem. And therefore, we can rewrite the problem as follows. Maximize over x greater or equal than zero, the benefit that you get from x plus the benefit that you get from y that we're going to write using this expression, w minus px over q. Now, there is only one extra twist. The original problem also had the constraint that y has to be non-negative. This implies that x has to be less or equal than w over p. Why? 
because for any value of x greater than that, y becomes negative. This is very easy to see. That means that we have transformed this very complex two-dimensional problem using the quality constraint into this simple problem that resembles the ones that we have seen before. Maximize an objective function over two constraints, a lower bound constraint, which in this case happens to be zero, and an upper bound constraint given by this. The second remark is that you should try to identify and exploit the additional benefit account cost structure that is implicit in the problem. You know, at first sight, when the problem is written like this, maximize over x greater than or equal than zero and x less or equal than w over p, u of x plus b of w minus p x over q. This looks like addition. Like the, like the, this looks like the objective function is the addition of two benefit functions. It doesn't seem to have this benefit and cost structure that proved so useful in previous sections. However, if you stop to think for a second, you will see that the benefit and cost structure is also implicit here. Let's see how. What we're going to do is erase this plus sign and rewrite this as minus minus this function. This I'm going to call the benefit function, just as before. And this minus b function, I'm going to call the cost function. So again, think of this function with the minus sign as the cost function of taking x units or buying x units of good x in that interpretation of the consumer. Now, here is why I can think of this as a cost function. Let's plot the function c of x as a function of x. Notice that when x equals to 0, the function takes a value of minus b of w divided by q. And then as x increases, the function goes up until the point w divided by p let, where the function, for example, here takes a value minus w of 0. It doesn't really matter whether it's above or below for the point that I'm about to make. So let's say do something like this. Now, notice that the first derivative of this c function is equal to p divided by q b prima, which since b prima is greater than 0, is greater than 0. And the second derivative is equal to minus p over q square b double prima, which since b double prima is less than 0, and there is a minus sign here, is also greater than 0. So this function is telling you mathematically that as x increases, you have something that looks like a cost that is increasing at an ever-increasing rate. It looks like a lot of this cost in the concavity assumption cases that we have been seeing. This is a mathematical way of thinking about it. But there is an even more intuitive way of thinking about it that I hope you will appreciate now, which is the economic intuition. What happens when you take a, a unit of action x, when you increase x? Well, you get a benefit. But you also get a cost. And the cost is the fact that as you increase x, you can do less y. So every unit of x decreases how much you can do of y. And that is the cost by how much what you can accomplish in benefits for B goes down. So as X goes up, C goes down, and that decrease is the marginal cost. So bottom line, even though this problem looks extremely different, is actually a special case of this benefit and cost structure that we have seen before. And we're going to exploit that in characterizing the solution. Now we're going to characterize the solution. As before, we're going to have to worry about interior and corner solutions. It's the nature of the beast and it's unavoidable. Let me describe first to you what an interior solution looks like. And we can, again, get a lot of insight just by looking at the graphical representation of the first order conditions. So we are going to have that we're going to maximize over x from a range of x equal to 0 to our upper range of x equals w divided by p, 
What I mean by that is that the solution is to be constrained in this range. Remember that by the quality constraint here, y is equal to w over q, and here y is equal to zero. Once we know x, we know y. Now, let's plot the marginal benefit of taking x, which is just u prime of x. So u prime of x is going to look, let's say, something like this. This is going to be u prime of x, which in our interpretation of cost and benefits just represents the marginal benefit of taking x. Now, the key question is, what does the marginal cost function looks like? Well, we know, we've seen before, that <clears throat> the marginal cost at zero is given by PQ B prima of um, W divided by Q at that point. We, we computed that derivative before. It has to be positive. And then it's going to increase at an ever-increasing rate until it reaches a point like this, which, by the way, is going to be given by P of Q B prima of zero. Now, an interior solution is going to have the property that these two curves, oh, sorry, I should have highlighted, apologized, that this curve, which is the marginal cost, which is just this P over Q B prima of this function, sorry, W, this is complicated, W minus PX divided by Q is the marginal cost function in this interpretation of the problem. Now, what does the solution look like when the two cores intersect in the interior of the constraint set? Not surprisingly, everything that we, given everything that we have seen, the solution is going to be given by the point x star at which marginal benefit equals marginal cost, just as we have seen along. Now, of course, the interesting question is, what does this equation look like? Can we say something more detailed about this in terms of the u and the b functions? And the answer is yes. So if we want marginal benefit equals marginal cost, marginal benefit is going to be equal to u of x. Marginal cost is going to be equal to this p q of b prima of y, just substituting back the fact that that is y. And if you do a little bit of algebra, you get that x and y is going to be fully determined by two equations. The first one is that u prima x star divided by b prima y star, this is just passing this down here, has to be equal to p divided by q at an interior solution. And the second, of course, is that the equality constraint needs to hold. So we know that px star plus qy star has to be equal to the level of wealth in the consumer interpretation to w more general. So there are two unknowns, two equations. This fully characterizes a solution that is interior. But notice, please, and let me highlight this and emphasize, this Equations only characterize the solution for the interior case. So before you can apply these equations, you have to know that you are in the interior case. Otherwise, you're going to mischaracterize the solution. There are two additional cases that we need to consider that involve corner solutions. The first one is going to involve a solution of the form all the money is expended in x. So x star is equal to w over p and y star is equal to zero. The second case is going to involve the opposite solution, x star equal to zero and y star equals to w divided by q. Now, how do the pictures for these cases look like? Well, for this case, we are in a situation in which the cost, and sorry, here is the upper constraint, x equals w over p, this is x equals 0. The cost function, what represents the marginal cost function, never goes above the decreasing marginal benefit. In this case, we want to end up 
been at this point for all of the obvious reasons and intuitions that we have seen so far. The other case looks um, symmetrical in some sense. If you have, again, the constraint x equals w over p, is a case in which the marginal cost curve is always above this marginal benefit curve. And therefore, the best, so this is the marginal benefit curve, this is the marginal cost curve in our interpretation, and the best that you can do is pick this point, which entails x star equals 0 and y star equals w over q, whereas here you are at x star w over p and y star equals 0. Not surprisingly, given everything that we have seen, these are cases in which the marginal cost and marginal benefit curves do not cross in the interior of the feasible range. Now consider some additional intuition for why the interior solution must satisfy the condition u prima at x star divided by b prima at x star has to be equal to this ratio of the prices. Why does it have to satisfy this condition? Well, remember a key property of an optimum, which is that you cannot carry out a small deviation from it within the feasible set and make your total payoff bigger. So to see why this has to be the case, suppose that you were at x and consider a small change delta x greater than 0, i.e. increasing delta x by a tiny bit. What is going to be the change in payoff? The change in total payoff is going to be equal to delta x times u prime of x, because you are increasing consumption of x, this will go up, minus delta x p divided by q b prime of y. Let me explain this term, which is a little bit more complicated. Now, when you increase your expenditures of x by delta x, that costs you this much money, delta x times p. Now, in order to maintain the quality constraint, you have to decrease consumption of y by this. So think of this as being the change in y that is necessary to maintain the quality constraint, the budget constraint in the case of the consumer. Now, but that decrease in y that's why it's negative, is going to entail a, a, a loss in utility given by all of this term. Now, this change in total payoff is going to be greater than zero if and only if, if you do a little bit of algebra, you get that u prima of x divided by p prima of y is greater than p divided by q. So in other words, if we were in a situation where u prime, the ratio of u prime of x divided by b prime of y was greater than this ratio of the prices, you could improve your total payoff by increasing delta x, by increasing x by delta x, a very small delta x. So x could not have been an optimum. Now consider the opposite case of what would be the effect of a delta x less than zero. Well, it's going to be the same equation. except that delta x now is negative, and the total payoff is going to be greater than zero if and only if, if you do a tiny bit of algebra with the inequalities, u prima of x divided by b prima of y is less than p divided by q. In other words, if this is the case, you can do better than x by the pair x comma y, or by the level of the control variable x, by decreasing it a tiny bit. In other words, by consuming less x and consuming less y. So the only point at which you cannot play these local changes and improve your total payoff is when the pair x, y, and I'm sorry, there is a typo here, y star satisfies that condition. Just because this optimization problem is so canonical and so important, let me provide it with yet one more intuition that has a very strong graphical component that some of you may find even more appealing. So think 
of the problem in a graphical way as follows. The individual needs to pick a pair x, y. In the interpretation of the consumer, how much of x, good x and how much of, a, of good y to consume. Now, he cannot pick any pair of x and y. He has to pick pairs of x and y that lie in a budget constraint that is linear, crosses here at w over q, crosses here at w over p, and has a slope of minus p divided by q. If you don't see this obviously or immediately, you should do the math and verify this by yourself to convince yourself. Now, the other key element of the problem is that the subject is trying to maximize a objective function that looks like u of x plus b of y. Now, you can draw this course given the concavity assumptions that we have imposed, you can draw a course that looks like this. Which are what are called <coughs> <coughs> level sets, which are cores that have the property that u of x plus b of y are equal to a constant. And since the u and the v function increase with x and y, the more you move upwards in this direction, the higher the level of the constant that they achieve. These are core level sets because these are combinations of x and y that generate a constant total payoff. Total payoff is constant within a level set. Now, given this graphical intuition, it's very easy what you want to do. We know that we have to be in this region of the curve because x and y need to be greater or equal than zero, we know that this course, the value of the total payoff in this level set increases as you go out. So what we want to do is we want to find the level set that is just tangent here. That is the solution, x star, y star to the problem. It's clearly the maximum achievable level for the maximization problem. Now, in order to understand the properties of that point, Notice the following. What is the slope at a typical point in a level set? Well, we can, we can compute that easily by noticing that taking the derivative of the equation of a level set, which is dx u prima plus dy b prima has to be equal to 0. And that implies that dy divided by dx is equal to minus u prima over b prima. So, what do we know? That at any point, the slope of the level set is minus u prima over v prima. Now, notice that the curve that just touches here has to be tangent to the constraint set. And that implies what we have been seeing all along, that our interior solution, u star, sorry, u of x star, divided by b of y star has to be equal to p divided by q. In other words, the slope of the level set that just touches has to be equal to the slope of the equality constraint at an interior solution. Now, I'm not going to do this for the sake of time, but a good exercise for you would be to draw what this picture looks like when you are at a constraint case in which you consume all in x and nothing in y, or vice versa in this particular case, in which you consume all on y and nothing on x.